What's up, everybody? Another, another day, <coughs> another life. I'm a little tired. That's okay. I'm uh, super stoked for our guest today. It is none other than uh, Juliana Furci, Furki. Probably mispronouncing her name, but Juliana. She's the founder of Fungi Foundation. She's a field mycologist. She's an author, all out epic human mushroom being, and uh, I'm like super stoked to have this chat with her. And da, da, da. how did you know? How did you know I wanted to invite her? No, we're gonna go under the Fungi Foundation one. Yeah, that's it. Here we go. And uh, uh, Juliana, you said you're in the. Okay, well, let's do yours. Great. Yeah, that's what I thought. Like Juliana, I wanted to go live on the Fungi Foundation. So she's just going to switch accounts real quick. And in the meantime, uh, I think we're just going to have an amazing talk on mushrooms and um, mushroom activism, fungal activism, that's the thing, and uh, foraging, which uh, right now in Central America is full on rainy season. And uh, we're super abundant here. I'm always happy if I can grow mushrooms in their natural environment, which is more my thing. And here we go. Check it out. Ah, it's Juliana again. Let's see. The sound is super high. Hmm. Interesting. Hi, I'm Gina. Hey! Hello! Juliana. Hello. So happy you made it. How are you? Happy belated birthday, Jasper. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm pretty good. I'm a little tired. We had like a, a big workout today, uh, but that's all right. So it's been... Uh, like a nice couple of days. I'm actually leaving the lake soon for a couple of months. So that's also coming up. So I feel like it's ne never enough days, but uh, I'm very happy to be sitting here with you. Where are you calling from today? I'm in Santiago, Chile at the moment. Ah. Yeah. So nice. hemisphere, beginning of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always so crazy to be that you guys are just coming up to summer. Is it also mushroom season in Chile right now? Um, we're in the middle of winter and it's... <laughs> Yeah, and it's, no, it's just ended, like the big mushroom season just ended, and we're waiting for um, spring mushrooms, which always bring the amazing, like, Citaria and Morcella, and yeah, mm. we need to wait a few months. Yeah, I'm always so surprised that, like, <clears throat> especially when I first found the mush started mushroom hunting in Australia, I was like, how... Everything else is so isolated here, but mushrooms seem to just be very similar in most places in the world. So I'm also happy to hear that Morcella has come up in your spring, which is our like fall or summer almost. So that's, uh, how do you think that happens? Do you think that happens because of the, the spores does, don't care about continents? Or do you think that they're so old and ancient that they've just been around before the plates started moving well, in the way they are right now? The substrates are the key. So, for example, Australia, New Zealand, and the southern cone of South America share the same funga, the same fungal diversity, because they were once Gondwana. Well, we, mm. you know, the, it was once the supercontinent Gondwana. So we're still finding new species to science that are Gondwanic. So they were around before the continents split. Mmm, that's amazing. Yeah. I love that. They're really, really old species. Amanita Galactica. Um, that was described... What a name, by the way, Galactica. Yeah. <laughs> it's a galaxy. Um, that's a Gondwanic species of Amanita. It's a very ancient species. These are elders. Mm. You know, they're old species of fungi. Mm. Why do you think that they have not evolved as rapidly as, uh, for example, animals have, right? When Gondwana was still around, even like... 15,000 years ago, we still had like massive megafauna here in America, right? You had giant ground sloths and like mammals well, especially seem to evolve so fast. Well, you know that, I mean, fungi do, some fungi evolve really, really fast, right? So when we talk about mammals, it's like saying, um, let's, you know, a mushroom. It's not like fungi, right? Because mammals are just a group of kingdom animalia and you know, so we can't really compare all the kingdom of the fungi to just mammals. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the kingdom of the fungi or queendom of the fungi, there are many species that have evolved, you know, and, and many, many groups of species that have evolved very quickly. And there's still some old ones around. And it's the same for plants and animals. There are still some, you know, even mammals that are ancient, that are old species and other 
you know, other groups that have evolved um, more quickly. Mm. I, I, I always thought... In that sense. Yeah, can you repeat that? You dropped out because I think if I talk and you talk, so it's a weird thing. That different in that sense. It's just that we don't see them all the mm. time. We need to coincide in this magical encounter that, that can only happen sometimes for a few days a year or a few days every many years. Mm. And I think that's like a big part of the, the magic of uh, mushrooms. And to go back like a little bit, right? Because like the mushrooms we were talking about, they're either like asco mycota or basidio mycota. And like, it seems that a lot of the basidio mycota, which you can in some strange way relate to animals because they're very, um, the very evolved specimens of the queendom. Um, but like that philosophy Cubensis, that's like the one I'm specializing also in foraging, is found everywhere in the world where we find humans, even like in super remote places like Australia, must indicate that they're also like been around for a long time. Well, you know, it's funny. We, we um, the Fungi Foundation together with the Natural History Museum of Utah and with um, Bryn Dentinger, we're working on a phylogenomic study of the genus mm. site. To be. And we've been working on that for over a year now. And um, so we're getting whole genome sequences of all the species and we're getting them from types, from the type species. Um, and we've already been able to um, get, you know, some ideas and some insight into the origin of the genus um, that comes from Africa. Um, mm. the, the genus Silosibi originates in Africa and from there it radiates around the world. And we've also been able to do some timing onto the evolution of the species. And it's, it's so much older than humans are as a genus. So much older. I mean, they've been around, Psilocybe has been around um, as, um, as, a, as a conformed genus um, for many uh, decades of millions of years. <laughs> yeah, so mm. over a million years, maybe 20, over 25 million years. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Are you guys working together with um, like um, citizen mycologists? We just did a webinar with Alan Rockefeller and he taught yeah. like DNA barcode sequencing and that, that must oh. be such a help of just having people that go forage and send out these um, DNA barcodes for sequencing to these labs and like do you collaborate with these people or the labs well, that do the sequencing? Well, we're, do we're doing full genomes. So it's mm -hmm. not genes. So the, the, the sequencing that that Alan and friends are doing has to do with certain gene clusters or gene regions. But the work we've been developing now for, for the last year has to do with the whole genome of the type specimens. So mm. the actual specimen from which the species was described, because that's as far back as we can go with certainty to the Latin name to be able to talk about, you know, to be able to compare. So, um, where see, we, we get a full genome from the Psilocybe cubensis specimen from which Psilocybe cubensis was described. Mm. So the actual physical mushroom that was given, that first get, got the name Psilocybe cubensis. And from there, a whole genome. And from there comes the comparison of all the genus. So yeah, the answer is yes, we collaborate with citizen science for other things. But in this particular project about um, psilocybe, it's, it's whole genome sequencing, which is so much bigger than, than what we can do just from, you know, from our home or from, from, from a small lab. Ah, thank you for elaborating. That yeah. makes total sense. Okay, <laughs> so this is one question that um, I get asked a lot and I also like ponder a lot. So the genus Solosky has been around for more like 20, 30 million years. Uh, it originated in Africa as well. So why do you think is the, well, what do you think is the evolutionary benefit of creating compounds like psilocin and psilocybin? If you look at, for example, other fungi or um, plants that mm -hmm. use um, not lethal methods for um, dealing with pests, it's often something for um, the pests to forget where the plant or the fungus has been. Like there was, I was reading this, book on like catnip, I think, and the, like the, oh, I, I think I heard it from Michael Pollan, uh, the, like the new book. Um, but um, what he was saying is like his cat always forgot where the catnip is. And if you look at, for example, cannabis, it's like ants that eat our cannabis also forget where the cannabis plant is so that they can't take the whole colony there. 
Yeah. Um, but with like psych psychedelic or psychoactive compounds like psilocybin and psilocybin, you definitely are not forgetting where you found these mushrooms. So what do you think is the, has been the evolutionary benefit of these mushrooms producing these compounds for millions of years before humans came on the scene? Um, well, it's not very clear with um, psilocybin and with psilocybin and with psilocin. Um, you know, it's, there have been some rearing experiments. I think it's important to keep in mind that the compound isn't, the compounds aren't only found in the genus psilocybin. So, you know, you're finding, you can find these, these compounds in um, gymnopolis, in inosibi, in different genera of fungi. Um, so it's not something that's exclusive to one type of mushroom. It's not even exclusive necessarily to the mushroom shape. So it's something that the fungi are um, producing um, that is independent of their um, interaction with humans. That's, we know that more or less for sure, because otherwise, you know, it would only be found in one certain group of fungi that has to do with us. Um, we, you know, there may be some sort of, uh, it might, you know, th there's no answer. I could elaborate with many, you know, ideas that I've had you know, over the years, but we, we don't know why different fungi produce psilocybin and psilocin. We don't know. Yeah. It's one of the great mysteries. And it will always be a mystery, I think. And that's it, also uh, exciting to me that there's things that we probably, as humans, will never figure out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, like, normally I do a little introduction of, like, I just felt like diving deep in. But I'm still curious to, to hear your story of, like, how did you become the empowered fungal like matriarch almost that you are for the community in many ways that you are today like where did it start for you did you grow up in like a mushroom loving family what it was no, like for you no i um so i've been working for the fungi now for 23 years many can't tell when they look at me now i'm joking um but yeah i started 23 years ago and it was from an encounter in a forest where i saw a mushroom that i wanted to know who i wanted to know who it was and there were no books here in Chile. And I thought, I'm going to do this. And it was just like a, it was like a, a, a lightning bolt. And it sparked, that first encounter sparked uh, an, an ineludible responsibility. This, I, I have tried to do other things in my life and it's just impossible. I, I, this is what <laughs> I was born to do. And honestly, from that day on, I, I have always worked for the fungi and because there was nothing done here like there were no books there was nowhere to study there were you know there was hardly anybody to talk to about fungi i just started building all that first by myself for the first 10 years or so um and then i founded the fungi foundation which is the first ngo on earth that works for the fungi you know full time we've, we've been around for close to 10 years now um born in Chile, but happily now expanded. We have an office in the US, one in Chile, and, and hopefully many more will, will appear. And um, it's just been a, a really focused um, mission that isn't separate from my existence in any way at all. Like, you know, there's, there's nothing in my life that doesn't revolve around fungi. And, and that's been the case for over two decades. So, I, and I, I think that what, one thing that also happens is that, you know, there, there are a group of us that have been around for, for a very long time doing this, you know, before there was more of a sort of, you know, hype, mainstream hype around fungi. And, and, you know, that gives you a lot, a lot of, um, like you really had to hack the fungal passion and love and work to stay in the space and you know make a living and to be able to to um you know know more because there was nowhere to 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 study there was not you know i was 21 or 22 maybe 21 and i you know saved up for a year and i went to take a course with paul stamets and that was 2004 or something um when paul had a stutter so you know i i met him with a stutter the one he talks about in, in the movie fantastic fungi and um and you know and then working with gary linkoff and just all the old folk who who strived so much to make fungi you know be acknowledged and be loved in the mainstream and now what we're living is this massive boom of fungal love that we dreamt of you know um so i think it has to do with this just like fixation, obsession, and 
not, not being able to separate fungi from, from existence. And then just having really gone through decades of a, of a hard space, a space that wasn't as easy as it, as it is now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And like, thank you for pulling through. And like, that's always so inspiring to hear passion make people go through a path that actually doesn't make it seem logical at all and actually come to a point where it all pays off. And would you mind sharing a little bit about those early years when you decided like, okay, mushrooms are my life. I'm not going to do anything else. What, like, what were some ways for you to make it sustainable before even the Fungi Foundation? Yeah, so um, there, there, I mean, there wasn't a way to make it economically sustainable. Um, and that involved a lot of, you know, working, you know, working at night, working during the day to be able to, you know, get, um, I mean, I think the best way to say this is that um, work, of course, we know is separate from earning money. And so the work always went on, even if it didn't earn money and you just earn money another way, right? So that went on for a very long time. And the foundation is born in a way to build a platform for people to be able to find a space and to maybe start creating ways of, you know, generating income. But the, for the first years, it was either through projects, doing field mycology. So like hardcore exploration, Patagonia up to the Atacama Desert. And I did that for many years with a big grant from a Chilean foundation. And just, you know, walking around and documenting fungi um, uh, for about six or seven years in very extreme places. And that was just so that we could get illustrations and collections. So that was the first sort of income I had. And it took me away from home seven or eight months a year. And I did that for yeah six to seven years. Then I, I um, in 2000 and ooh, maybe three, I set up a reishi cultivation um, like business and imported reishi to Chile. This is with my friend Carolina Mañasco. Um, and we set up a big you know, commercial reishi, uh, reishi cultivation farm. And you know, people would come to us to purchase the fungi and we, I just like couldn't sell them. I couldn't, sell. <laughs> I, I couldn't sell somebody, you know, with some sort of illness, a, a mushroom. So, you know, we gave them all away, you know, shut down the business. Like we're not commercial people. And that's when um, I set up the foundation. So I, I started writing books about fungi um, and I started, you know, helping the government try to get fungi included in the legislation. And that's when it really just came to, to the fact that I had to set up, you know, a legal structure that had to be a nonprofit because I was just useless at selling. Like I can't, I can barely sell a book. I like, I like giving away, you know, uh, I was born to give, not to sell. <laughs> so that's a bit how the beginnings were. And it was a lot of collaboration. So it was a lot of traveling to people, like to Paul's place or go to the US. Um, I'd you know, go to England, to Italy, um, and different places around the world, just trying to meet these people that were the you know, teachers um, to, to try and get some knowledge. I would devour every book that would come my way. And then finally got to the point in 2016 when, um, or well, 2015 yeah, or 16, that um, Harvard University, the head of mycology there, Don Feaster, like just said, all right, I'm taking you under my wing. And he invited me over to Harvard and he taught me, he sat down with me for weeks and taught me, you know, hardcore microscopy and all the details. And, um, and I've been for foraying with him ever since here in Patagonia. Um, yeah, for, for for many years now, and and mm -hmm. and he really sort of taught me a lot about mycology, and um and invited me to be a Harvard associate, and that opened many more doors, like the academic doors. Yeah, mm. I think that's one of the most beautiful thing about the the mushroom world, the mycology world, because there's not like many institutionalized places for people to learn. It's a lot about finding the individuals, and then the individuals that you connect with, and then the individuals being a mentor, student relationship, and not only are you learning, but you're also building a, a, a beautiful like human connection, which is, yeah. I think, the connection is obviously the, the archetype of the mushroom. So it's, it's really cool. Like, that's how it's working. And that's also what we're really focused on. That's why we're right now 50 people or so living together that are all stoked about mushrooms and what yeah. they can, they can yeah. give us. And yeah, it's like super inspiring. And I must be very, <laughs> I'm very happy you made it to where you are. Well, with giving so much, you know, like I've, 
I, I also live giving, but like uh, I've, my past has crossed me through a, a path of sales before as well, which is, I'm, I'm sometimes also grateful for, but like it always goes hand in hand, right? And like, I'm very happy that I'm at a stage of Fungi Academy is at a stage that we can start giving more and especially yeah. to like Fungi Foundation. And that's like, um, I'm so happy that you guys are, are there because like we, we're supporting some local projects that like on water and like helping the local Mayan community here, but like there's nobody else. And it's just so weird to me that there's more species of fungi than there are two plants, like 6 to 1. Some people are even saying 10 to 1. And there's, there's one <laughs> foundation. Yeah, the, the, um, it's true. It's, it's incredible that there's only one um, organization. Well, I think there are more. There are more. Mm. Like, we, were, we were the first, and there are many other NGOs building up in, in Latin America especially. But, um, but they're still sort of you know, more like uh, they're not full-time organizations you know that that big leap of faith is hard to take you know and it's hard to sustain but i was just going to go back and I, the data so the six to one uh, comes from uh, a study in the uk in the british isles there's a study um for boreal for for example that gives you 21 you know so there are different studies out there depending on the region of the world so um, the, you know, the mean is somewhere between 12 and 15. Imagine that species of fungi to every plant. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, I just did a, a bunch of research on endophyte and endophytic fungi for this new course we're creating. And it just like, point one, I was very impressed how much research there was available. I had to go through several, like more than 100 page papers and there, that there's never been a wild plant that was encountered that didn't at least have one endophytic fungi in their system. It's very interesting. and. It's, like some people were even claiming like really radical things that like no plant is making the medicinal compounds, but the fungi within the plant cell walls are making the compound yeah. and the plant is just sort of a, like a hospital and the, the, the fungi in the, in, in the plant are the nurses. You know, it's, it's, um, I always like to say, you know, it's all about point of view. When I mm. see a tree, I see a photosynthetic symbiont of a fungus, right? Some people look at a tree and think, oh, you know, or look at the mushroom and they think, oh, it's just, it's the mycorrhizal fungus of a tree. But, you know, it's, it's all about point of view. The one thing that's just undoubted is that without the fungi, no plant would live out of water. And they really just are the, an essential part of life on earth. And that's why at the foundation, we're very focused on their acknowledgement, their, their formal acknowledgement in policy, in language. Um, and and from there, building all the frameworks that can then trickle down for there to be, you know, funding for education, for research, you know, and for different things. But we need to say the F word, you know, we need to say their mm -hmm. name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially since, to me, it makes total sense that, like, panspermia is a thing. So for people that don't know, panspermia is the idea that, like, life didn't originate on Earth, but it's, like, originated elsewhere, possibly even extra uh, stellar uh, yeah. or on Mars or on Venus and somehow spores that we know can survive in the space. We even know that living lichen can survive in space for up to three weeks. I think it's the longest that NASA has put them out of the ISS and then brought them back in and they just went and did their thing on a regular basis. Well, if, I always envisioned this. If I was like a, um, a civilization of hyper intelligent beings and I wanted life to uh, thrive everywhere, I would just shoot, so, like create an organism like a fungus even, or like, and shoot spores in every direction and hoping that it would land because anywhere there's water and the conditions are right. Some people are even saying that like, there might be some fungi living on Mars. Like it's me, it's the so, most logical, efficient way to get life to be everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really an incredible way. I mean, just the spores, um, and, and that's where that's why originally fungi were considered you know cryptogamic plants because you know the the mosses and you know the ferns and even some protists you know like red algae they all produce these these spores but really i think it's the ballista spore that really changes you know the way um the way dispersion you know can can happen this this mechanic ejection of spores out into into space um that that many basidiomycetes have that many mushrooms have it really is a game changer and and i always like to 
mentioned Buller, you know, and Buller's drop. We call it Buller's drop, but it's really not his drop. He just discovered it. But he discovered this fantastic mechanism, you know, where fungi use water to eject spores like really far away from their bodies. It's incredible. It's so, so awe and one awe inspiring, you know. You mean uh, the, the hedgehog fungus, Philobotus crystallinus, or the, no, the Don Cannon? No, or is no. it a different system? So it's a different system. So, so um, mushrooms, most cap, cap and, uh, so pileus and stipe, cap and stem mushrooms, uh, on the lamellae, so they produce this big cell called a basidia, and the basidia mm -hmm. is where the spores are attached. For that spore to be released, there's a mechanical system known as the Buller, Buller's drop. And it's a, a droplet of water condensates on the spore. And finally, it sort of merges with another droplet and, on, on the basidia and, and the spore is ejected. But it's a mechanical mm. system on the lamellae, on every basidia on the side of each lamellae of a, of a cap. And it's just this extraordinary way of, of ejecting spores um, in the, by the millions that doesn't occur with the other spore producing organisms, the protists or the plants. So, mm. yeah, incredible. Look up. I didn't know that. Buller's drop is the Buller's coolest, drop. coolest mechanisms, you know, in the fungi. Yeah. 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 I, I... For me, like what came to mind with water and fungi, it's the, the like the hydro fungus that uses water tension. So it just accumulates this water drop on its, I think it's an ascomycota, so it's like a spore yeah. sac. And then like a catapult, it like launches back and it shoots off the sack of spores. And it goes from zero to like 40 kilometers per hour in the first millimeter. And that's like yeah. Mach 10. And it's like the fastest organism on earth. It's, uh, it's crazy how those fungi are able to apply that. Yeah, that that um, that mechanism does it so fast. But the incredible thing about um, the basidiomycetes that form the mushrooms is that that's how they all eject their spores. Mm. Something that has evolved to happen, and it's um, it, and it's the only way for the those types, so the the agaricalis that form this um, this structure have this. It's called the ballista spore. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, the, as you say, you know, what, what a better way to just maximize your opportunity to, to live and to, uh, you know, to um, establish in, in any life form, in any life place. Mm. I was like, I made a, a video together with the YouTube channel After School that was a lot about fungal intelligence, right? Because fungi to me are so intelligent and they don't have a perceived brain. And it's almost like these uh, bullet drops uh, Bullet spores. What was the exact name again? But they, um, mm. ballista. but they, it's ballista spores. They almost look like they're planned ahead and not like randomly evolved. How we're thinking that like evolution works right now? It's like an ultra random mutation. But some of these mechanism in fungi, they don't seem that random at all. And like they almost look like they have like some manipulation over what how their genome evolves. Well, yeah. In, so there, there are features that have when they you know you you hear um you know heavy scientists say this feature has evolved multiple times what they're really saying is that um different organisms got to the same conclusion through evolution you know on separate roads many times so for example with animals the eyes have eyes have evolved many times it's not that in the in a, in a you know in what we know in a phylogenomic or phylogenetic timeline, it's not that there was one original organism with an eye and then everybody else who has eyes comes from there. No, you have many roots to eyes. With fungi, you have many roots back in these trees, in these relationship trees, back to the same features. So, you know, um, the fact that fungi go underground and go sequoiaed and go into the soil. That has happened many times in separate lineages of fungi. It's not that it happened once and then they all derive from there. So yeah, that's, I call that intelligence in a way and evolutionary intelligence, yeah. Mm. Mm. I like that word. I don't think I've heard it before, evolutionary intelligence. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's really powerful.
So like we've, we talked about this idea of mycophilia, right? And this rise of mycophilia all over the world right now. And if you look at actually at our ancestors, that was already the case. Like, uh, like I'm a big fan of Otzi the Iceman. Big, like I used to go skiing in that area and that's what I first learned of him. And I was really into like paleo humans. And I just thought it was super epic that we found this, this completely intact human. Um, um, why do you think like that mycophobia started to appear, especially in Europe, if you look at like how aware um, somebody like Otzi was of his environment and how unaware we were until like, I guess like maybe a hundred years ago, like really, like only like the, the love has been only appearing for the last 40, 50 years or so. But uh, like the knowledge is like only been rediscovered in uh, like the middle of the 19th century, I guess. Uh, one of the things like the oldest one, like uh, recollections I have of, um, of our understanding of like fungi is that I read somewhere that actually uh, J.R. Tolkien was inspired by his friend who was a mycologist on mycorrhizal fungi and like that's why Sam got this pouch of dirt at the end of uh, of the elf so he can like regrow the shire with this amazing special dirt um so yeah. like where does this like re rejuvenation or the actually the decline of mycophilia uh, started I, th I i think that it's really different in different regions of the world and we can't talk about it as a one so you mm. know if you go to you know places in um, you know, in South America or in Central America, you find a very profound established fungal love and appreciation and dependence. And there's no mycophobia there. Um, whereas, you know, the places where, you know, in some places in Europe, like in Great Britain, um, especially Great Britain, we know that the mycophobia comes from in many cases blights so, or famines so I don't know if you've read there's a really really cool book that I recommend to everybody called uh, The Triumph of the Fungi by Nicholas P. Money. Nick Money he's, a, he's a, a fantastic mycologist who has written many books he wrote The Rise of the Yeast you know he's written just really really cool sort of historical studies around fungi and in The Triumph of the Fungi you can read you know about um, cases where um, fungi have, you know, triumphed, but in many cases to the demise of humans. And so some of those are explain, you know, what, what's going on. So, for example, in Ireland, you know, the potato blight, you know, produced a huge famine. People were dying and it was, you know, it was associated to a fungus, which we now know may not be a fungus, but it was associated to a fungus that was, um, that was killing the potatoes, that was the staple food. So we'll normally find mycophobia associated either to the Catholic Church saying that it was paganism or to some sort of biological um, you know, action that produced hunger or illness. But in many, many, many places of the world, mycophilia is very much intact, you know, very mm -hmm. much intact. And I've, I've, you know, I've forayed in close to 20 countries over my career, and it's the least of the countries that have strong mycophobia. Mm. Yeah, here in, um, well, we're, we're living in like Central America, Guatemala, and the heartland of the Mayan culture. And it's really funny that like, there's pockets where the Christian church had made more of an impact. Like on here in this side of the lake, it has made way more of an impact than on the other side of the lake where you have this big Mayan hub, uh, Santiago Atitlan. And on the markets there, they sell different amanitas that you can eat and yeah. uh, like some really rare species that I don't think it even has a common name. It's one of my favorites. It's Pseudophistelluna radicata. It's like this really firm, odd looking mushroom. And that's like, there's these micro um, cultures basically that are happening here and it's, it's it's very rare that like 30 kilometers away they speak a completely different language um, natively and like to see that that culture is also like pre-established re regarding that language. Um, one of the ways that I've always felt and like I, I, I want to do more research on this so I'm like I just wrote down the trend of the fungi and like I, I have a flight coming up and I'm sure I'll blast it through yeah. in one go um, but um, like the to me, it just made so much sense that the witch trials that happened in Europe and even like in uh, some parts of the United States were so connected to like the decline of knowledge of the fungi, right? Like if you look at the the archetype of the, the 
the, the witch, it's like the forager, somebody that's really completely tuned in with the environment. And obviously those people are, have the knowledge of the ne natural ecosystem of what mushrooms can heal us, what are not ed edible, which are um, po probably um, powerfully, um, sac powerful sacraments to use in like some psychedelic ceremonies. Uh, but like if you're being trialed for a job that you have, it's not necessarily that you like really want to protect that job. You're just like, well, if mushrooms like have the potential to get me on the stake, I'm just going to stop being into mushrooms for a while. Yeah. And you know, I mean, that, that whole, it, the whole, um, you know, the, the rise of, of um, sort of what we know as, as medicine today, sort of this, you know, established, you know, MD, you know, university mm -hmm. model comes to, you know, comes because there was a prohibition of the ancestral knowledge. Um, I've been, you know, Hey, I have I've given a really many times to talk about women in mycology, and what you see there is that before um, you know the 1500s, the traditional medicine, you know, and up to the, up to the 1600s, traditional medicine was carried by many women who had received you know this knowledge passed down from their ancestors and you know traditional knowledge and really when the church comes to say you know you're a doctor when you go to university not a doctor because you know how to heal you're a doctor because you you know we say you're a doctor and you've gone through this <laughs> um a lot got of the paper it was associated to paganism the women were killed most of them were dri were killed um, because they were associated. You know, and the notion of witch appears. So witchcraft, the, the, the power to heal or to change, um, with that not coming from that traditional established uh, line of knowledge. So what we see, you know, the fact that that ergotism, you know, it has exactly the same. Um, features that a witch does and you know what happened in Salem and in other places associated to the rye being infected with ergot really just is like the the visible part of of an extermination that happened for a very long time you know, for a very long time why do you think that um right now it seems if i uh, uh as a mycologist myself if i look at the scene there's it's a very man dominant field um, and it's, if you, so we just discussed, like, if you look at history, it wasn't like that. So why do you think it came to be where we are right now? And I'm very happy that more and more women are becoming interested. And yeah, you being the, 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 the like leader of the charge in many ways of this. Um, but like, what, why do you think this change has happened? Or why, why do you think that the first movers in this new, I guess, fungal renaissance were mainly men? You know, I, I think that there's a, what I've seen over my, my quite long experience in this is that there are two, at least two big mycological worlds. One is the one that we're, you know, very much in that has to do with outreach, with, you know, teaching outside of academia. And then there's the very hardcore academic mycology. In academic mycology, there are many, 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 many women. Like if you look at um, South America, Central America, uh, you, you mean the number of women, there are more women, more female mycologists than male mycologists. But if you look at the side of the outreach, um, you know, of general publications, of, um, you know, sort of really spreading to the masses, you will find there are more men, but really it's not a significant number of people in the first place, right? So you'll have maybe, can we count 10 people maybe off the top of your head now? What about 10 years ago? It wasn't 10 people, right? So, and, and, and from those 10, you know, uh, five years ago, um, there were some women, you know, less women than men. But I don't, I don't feel, and I've had, it's funny because I've been having this discussion with different female mycologists and it's, is that there's not a sort of deliberate um, uh, sort of exclusion of women from the sciences, at least not in South America recently, like the last 40, 50 years. Um, it was a lot, it was a lot way back. We must remember that, you know, it was the, the Dutch women 
were really important to mycology. Um, there were German women, English women. The first head of mycology at Kew Gardens in England for 40 years was a woman. So there is a history of female mycologists in academia. It's just that that hasn't trickled over into more of our space, which is more, more of the general teaching and outreach and general information and hyping up. So it, it's and hard to really say that there's been an exclusion, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting as a, a Dutch person myself, I've never heard of any of these Dutch impactful <laughs> women in like, no, Wait, not, I, not, not in school, not in the Dutch mushroom, right. like, like societies or cultures. So can you give me some names and I'm gonna do yeah, some research. I mean, the, the name of the most important uh, microbiology institute is, is named after a female mycologist who actually discovered Dutch elm disease, mm. right? Women led women lab. I mean, there's, um, there, there is, there is, I'll send you over the presentation. It's, it's cool. It must be up, you know, women in mycology, it must be up in, on YouTube somewhere so we'll look it up and 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 so there is there is you know there is this thing where women have been um they have been present i mean agar so the, the agar agar for, for petri dish was discovered by a woman she wasn't acknowledged fanny hess right it was her it was her professor who took the you know the credit for that but we know that she did it you know and she she has been acknowledged later in history um uh, you know, and, and there are other women in, in history that, that have really led, trailblazed the way for, for mycology in the academic space. Some recognized, some not recognized. But we can go back and talk about really important women like Meredith Blackwell. Meredith Blackwell is a North American mycologist who is, has led the way um, in even estimating, you know, how many species of fungi there are in the world. There are women like Catherine Aim, who is Mrs. Rust woman. Like she is discovering whole, you know, orders of rust fungi today from Purdue. You know, Kathy Aim is incredible. And so many other women. Uh, but, but then again, in our space, like in, in my, I sort of bridge them because I, I work a lot in academic stuff too. But um, in the world of outreach, there are very, very few. And that's where I'm more, more on my own, in a way, you know. And I've been on my own for so many years. But hope, but now there is a bigger hype and more women are coming in and, you know, raising their voice. And it's important for that to happen. Yeah, yeah. and like, that's also one of the things I'm like super stoked to, to facilitate while our Fungi Academy community is growing. And it's all about having, like, I think, what inspired me to focus more on empowering other people to, to like teach, not only like learn themselves, but also to share this knowledge is by where like Peter McQuay said, I think in uh, radical mycology, if you teach like one person, they can teach 10 people, they can teach a hundred people, you know, and that's, that really rang through to me. And that actually made me go on a quest of like, how can I like, because I, I, I'm like, I guess uh, not only born for the mushrooms, but also born with the confidence. Like I'll just do something that I'm probably underqualified for, but I'm passionate. So I'm just going to do it. And like to pass that down. And um, yeah, especially women is something that like, I'm like super stoked for. And especially also in the Netherlands, because you would think with like sacred mushrooms being legal, you think there's this massive movement, but actually it's no. like, the more I understand it, the smaller it is, you know, it's even hard to get like oyster mushrooms in the supermarket. And that's, I feel like sometimes in the bubble here in Guatemala, but I'm more and more called back to, to the roots, you know, to the home country. It's like, how can I get this mushroom movement more yeah. alive in the Netherlands? Because we have all the facilities, there's all the connections, there's so much happening there. And I just see that like, especially because it's so urban, we do need yeah. these food sources. You know, next year, the, um, the International Mycological Congress is in, is in the Netherlands. You know, we've been right. building that for, for quite a while. But I, I think that it's important to highlight there is a disconnect here. And that's where, you know, that's why the Fungi Foundation is well known in, in sort of both worlds, is that there is no direct connection between academia and all the generation of a lot of knowledge. There is, we know so much more about fungi than we think, right? But we, there's, there's no channel to get it out. That's why the foundation was born. It was to translate science to the public. That's been what we've been doing for such a long time, is taking that knowledge that is hard to understand because it's sort of like another language, but 
putting that into words that people can connect to, people can feel part of, that where people can feel they can make a contribution, right? To, to discovering species, to, to, you know, generating knowledge, to, to thinking about, you know, um, what fungi represent in so many other areas of life. But that disconnect is very real. And, um, and, and more and more, you know, people like Paul, Paul Stamets has been really connecting more and more. Now he's, you know, he, he's always published and he, he's formed in the university, but he's now really getting into the hard science and, and connecting a lot of what, you know, what, what people thought were just ideas and random knowledge to hardcore science. And, and, but there are very few of us doing that and we need many more people to do that because, you know, it's, as you say, there's a, there's a responsibility in teaching one because that one might teach 10. So that one that's teaching another really has to get into what's going on and, and, and try to um, just at least give, give the roads to knowledge. You know, you don't have, you don't have to have all the knowledge because of, but at least say, Hey, try talking to this person. Hey, try reading this, hey, you know, tr check here, check there. And, and that's a, a, the role that we've been trying to, to play for, for the last, you know, couple of decades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're doing fantastic because you make it relatable and personal and your passion just makes everything fun, right? And I think that's one of the big mistakes people that want to be a teacher. They make, they're like, oh, I need to give information to people. No, especially with the internet, people can find all the information they want. You just yeah. have to make them excited by telling great stories. And luckily the, the queendom of fungi is filled with great stories yeah. in many ways. And like themselves, they have all the attributes, you know, the the um the aesthetic and the like big you know headline attributes they're all there the, 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 we have nothing to add really <laughs> you know it's it's all ha it's all there well i feel like that the co the collaboration of what they're doing and then our human essence of storytelling and making it like even more exciting than it is because it is, well, I, I wouldn't say more exciting, but like at least making what they're actually doing uh, understandable for, for like most people. But yeah, because yeah, one of the things that actually got me out of academia is that like I had to write in the specific language and I had to like do this and this, and that was just never interesting to me because I was always inherently a storyteller and I made this beautiful story. It's like, oh no, you have to, Oh, this is not a word that you can use and you have to really write formally. And I was always like, this is boring. I'm like, not like I'm not being like my fire is not being stoked. And I think that's the most important thing. It's like, how can we stoke all of each other's fire to just do whatever we want, like want to do most in the world? Because I feel all humans have the great, great desire to do good for our communities and our home as well, you know, and like we just need to find those things that are uniquely uh, gifted within ourselves and how we can inspire others to find their own uh, little flame inside. Yeah, I, definitely. I, I totally agree. And it's so, so beautiful that we are finally at a time where knowledge isn't only endorsed, you know, in a big institution um, that's run by, um, you know, people who, who have a lot of bias. That's, you know, finally, that's, that's so important. Um, but I, I am, you know, in a way, because I have this more like a bit of an old, oldie, um, <coughs> oldie, you know, but goodie, but, um, you know, I sometimes worry, I have to say, I do sometimes worry that there's a lot of stuff that you can't, that, that you, that you, the people replicate without verifying. And the version doesn't have to come from a university. The verification can come from so many different ways. But I think it's important to exercise critical thought and to not just repeat, right? So when you, and, and, and that, you know, that's my, my hope for, for, for now, in, in every sense, my, the, my hope for my son, you know, when I see him, he, reach, he researches everything on the internet. I keep on thinking to myself, I hope he can question this as well, you know? I hope that he can also realize that not everything is answered. Not because you found an answer on the internet. It doesn't mean that, that something is answered, right? So that's, um, that's really... I, I have that desire. And I just wanted to go back because I found the name. It's Johanna Westerdijk. Johanna Westerdijk. There we Johanna go. Dijk. And she, um, very important uh, Dutch woman. She, yeah. is, um, she was the first director. 
She was appointed at Utrecht University in 1917. And she was the first director of the CBS Fungal Biodiversity Center and the first ever female professor in the Netherlands. She was a mycologist. So yeah, Johanna- Amazing. Went, yeah. You should update her Wikipedia page because it says she was a plant pathologist. Well, right. <laughs> She studied the fungi, right, the, the, so she discovered Dutch elm disease, yeah. Uh, that's so super was, impressive. She was a mycologist plant pathologist, yeah. But we should update it. She was very, very important. It's funny that like her, people called her Hans, which is a very uh, male name these days. My dad's called Hans. So that's oh. uh, another extra fun fact. Okay, to turn back a little bit about this idea from the, from the internet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I was born in the year that the internet became accessible to everybody, 1993. I call it 1993 sometimes. And I actually was, my parents had internet in the house really early. I remember like being four or five and having access only on the weekends because it was like this dial up modem and stuff like this. But when I went on the internet, there's one rule, believe nothing, nothing is real on the internet. And somehow in the last 20 years or so, everybody forgotten this main rule. It was like, yeah. and they just accept every, random Facebook posts that they encounter. And that to me is not, it's just so weird because it, it's not how I was raised with the internet. And I'm still always like doubting everything, even the things that I've read four or five times. I'm like, this is like, especially Wikipedia, it's just so easy to adapt. I can just change the whole thing about Johanna Westerdijk if I want right now. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> to have that critical thinking. And, um, and you know, and, and, and that also helps you understand the speed that, that that is necessary sometimes um, to to find something out, and and you know, per, in my personal journey here with the fungi, you know, I I am um, it's been a it's been a journey, an internal journey to sort of try to get people to understand that things take time. It's not immediate, you know. You can't you can't um, think of something and then immediately have a result the next day. You have to do it, and that, that takes the time. And the Fungi Foundation really has you know, concentrated in, in sort of getting it done, which has been really cool. It takes time, and, 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 but isn't it wonderful to be able to dedicate time to discover fungi or to you know, get them in, incorporated in, in legal frameworks? It, well, that's not as fun. It's fun when it happens. It's not fun to get it done. But, um, just just to take the time and the, and the critical thought and the, you know and get people together for fungal appreciation in in a in a long haul effort and that's i love the way you're all doing that at the academy with you know getting people to take a course you know to take the time to to really dedicate to to actionably to do you know to cultivate let's do it get your hands dirty you're not just watching a video of it right let's do this uh, I just, mm. I have, I really want to thank you for, for everything, for having, you know, for having put it out there and, and thank you for the support as well. Wow. You're so welcome. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how else I can like, uh, embrace these amazing compliments and we are just doing it out of love. You know, we just yeah. actually watched with the community. We just watched the prophets, the, the animated version of the book and this, this line that's so beautiful and I'm probably messing it up, but like, uh, um, uh, Work is love uh, made uh, manifested, basically. And that's, that's how I see it, you know? It's just like putting it out there and yeah, we're, we're not stopping here. We're making it more accessible. We're making it more engaging. We're focusing right now on something like really focused on younger people and kids because that's the future, right? If we can get these, like, like if I was into mushrooms from the, like when I was eight years old, I don't know how much knowledge I would have had right now, but like, I know I would have been exci as excited as I was when I first, uh, really dove into it when I was 18 years old and because of philosophy mushrooms uh, back in the Netherlands. That was like, I'm always so surprised that like most people in the field right now, it's like, yep, that's how it started for me, philosophy. And then I started wanted to grow my own philosophies. And then like you start growing your own oysters, then you start growing your own reishis. And then suddenly I've called the over like 20 different species of mushrooms. And you, <laughs> you hard to think of the philosophies. It's true. There are so many people. And I think what's happening now is that people are daring to say it. Mm -hmm. Even you yeah. know, ologists would never, have, you know, confess <laughs> they got into mycology because of psilocybe. <laughs> now they are. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's important. And I think also like the the legal landscape because for me it was always easy because literally I have nothing to be afraid of being yeah. like. Also, our company is based in the Netherlands. I'm from the Netherlands. Like 
that you can still buy psilocybin containing truffles in stores. You can still buy grow kits. You know what? Like my go I know deep down that my government is not going to chase me down because I talk publicly about these subjects and I understand people from the United States. I have to fly through the United States in a couple of days and it scares the fuck out of me. Really? Because I just know. Uh, I've been in a second screening a couple of times. I try to be, look all neat and like don't show my tattoos and anything, but they always put me, they always know something is, he's, uh, he's a weird one. No, he's going to no. mess up our people. <laughs> intimidating, but no fear, no fear. No, I know. It's like, it's just an understanding that there's a, a possibility of having a not so pleasant border experience more yeah. so than a, than a fear. And that, I don't have it in any other country than the United States. So I completely understand where people based in the United States and working in the United States coming from, and especially because it is and it's been very common that people that either sell spore prints or do mushroom educated have been um, knocked on the door by some federal uh, officers. And like, I think Paul Simmons also talks about this story in the Tim Ferriss podcast that like he had helicopters flying around and, you know, like, of course, you're not going to be public if you know that that's like looming over your head. But now with the legal landscapes changing, you know, we can finally be free and be ourselves and express the things that we want to express. Yeah, you know, it's so important because that's the, you know, the, the legality of anything fungal is a big issue. You know, We're, I mean, there's no, there's no acknowledgement of, of fungi in most legislations in the world. And, you know, sometimes it's good because you're going through, you know, you're going through customs and they ask, you know, do you have any plants or animals on you? And you might have a suitcase full of fungi and you can just write <laughs> no on the floor. Nope. <laughs> perfectly. But in other scenarios, it doesn't because you're like, wait, you know, we want, we, you know, there's, there's no, there's no acknowledgement at all of these um, organisms. But you know, it's a two way, two way with customs and that. Um, it's, sometimes it's good that they don't have fungi on the form. But you know, it's important to work towards getting acknowledgement of fungi um, in in legislation and conservation frameworks m more so. We were talking before about. You know everything all the incredible features and traits of this this group of organisms like we can you know the infamous the infamous you know mycelium leather and hats you mm. know and or whatever this is these are nature based solutions to current problems i mean these are this is technology that's been developed over hundreds of years and is hundreds of years old um you know we need to look at the fungi and at the fungal Based solutions that have already been um, developed by people like Otzi, right? To look at how we can move forward in the future. So um, it's important to get them acknowledged. And I want to just take the moment to say to every, you know, soon the Fungi Foundation will be showing a really, really important piece of work that we've been developing for uh, quite a while. Um, that's that basically is a compendium of, of ancestral and traditional uses of fungi known to humanity. Mm. Um, so that's really going to be a, a place where you can see how humans have culturally co-evolved with fungi in so many ways, so many ways, and how far we've come from that and how important it is to go back to that. So, mm. yeah, that's coming soon. Some, some important fungal history and fungal appreciation. I can't wait. And because, it's like, to me... Well, to, to the support of people like the, the Academy who help us do that, who help us be able to sit down and work for the fungi. So thank you very much. Mm, you're so welcome. And I can't wait to, to learn more because there's so many different ways. Like, like of course, the, the stone date theory is one of the most famous ones. And me living in a very conscious spiritual community, I was like trying to provoke people <laughs> by telling about the drunken monkey theory, which has been, um, <laughs> it's actually a theory right now because they found this enzyme that makes humans help process us like, like alcohol better. And this would have been a benefit for the fruits falling from the trees on the savannas that are like fastly fermenting. And, you know, yeah. it's, if, if you, I don't know if you've read uh, Brian Burrescu's book, The Immortality Key, but he addresses the beer before bread hypothesis as well, that we actually started cultivating grains because we're so into drinking beer compared to, yeah. and then we've later figured out that you can make bread out of the grains too, you know? I mean, beer is liquid bread, let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and beer, first origins of beer go back to, you know, five, six, seven thousand years before Christ. It was, it was, it was a way to, 
to ferment, you know, to sterilize a liquid to be able to do a crossing over a desert. I mean, we, we more or less know, you know, there are, there are stone receipts of trade of beer, you know, from what is today called Iran. Um, mm -hmm. and, and those, you know, so there is, there is an archaeological uh, history of how important beer was for the survival of humans in places where water would go, you know, would, would be a broth for culturing bacteria and it could, it would kill the humans very quickly, you know. And there's a yeah. beer key to sterilizing a liquid. Yeah. Okay, this is, this is a thing that puzzles me all the time and I, I've like asked this all the time, but I, it still puzzles me. So I'm wondering what your answer is to this because yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast, used to be a multicellular Ascomycota, and it somehow evolved into single cellular beings? How does that work? Okay, you need to read The Rise of the Yeast by Nick. Okay, I, the again, same man, okay. My good friend, Nick Money. Nick has amazing books. What he, a great name, by the way. Yeah, Nick, Nick is <laughs> he's, um, English, but he's in um, the US, and he's, he has amazing you know, provocative thought. And his, he has many books on fungi, many, many, many. They're all, one is better than the other, but The Rise of the Yeast and The Triumph of the Fungi. Those are my first mm. recommendations out there. Uh, he, he was at Telluride a few years back um, and gave a great talk there as well. You know, recommend, I don't know if that's actually online, but if you can find his Telluride talk, his Telluride Mushroom Festival talk, that's really cool. Amazing, yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't wait and also. Get just went to the sorry the academy should go to telluride to the mushroom fest i know it's not gonna happen this year but next year it's like it looks like it's gonna be the international like mycology uh thing in amsterdam straight after that telluride that's yeah. what it looks like right now Amazing. i'm like beyond stoked I've, I've been wanting to go to telluride forever but it's it's been uh, a challenge with like timing yes. and right like then we finally had some free time and then COVID happened so we've just been hanging here for two and a half years which hopefully <laughs> soon we're, we're rid of and the, so I, the I, books uh, the books again so it's the rise of the yeast and the triumph of the fungi those are the two books by Nicholas P. Money yeah yeah fantastic and I hope one day that um, we're, I'm, we're already kind of planning a little bit to have a, 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 a like a mushroom conference here in Guatemala too during the rainy season, and then we can. Uh, I know some uh, people that have been trained by the elders, like the local mine people that have been trained by the elders that are actually great foragers, and I would love to take people in and like embrace a little bit of the the local Mayan mycophilia with uh, uh, the people here, and I'll be in, in paradise and. It's some, I think there's, I forget the Latin name, but it's like a, uh, it's basic, almost identical to Amanita Cesarei, but like, oh, it's one of my favorites. Oh, yum. So it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and good. And we'll, we'll have it happening here. And uh, like, there's even um, a local Mayan lady that is growing oyster mushrooms with lime pasteurization techniques. And wow. we're like slowly empowering her to teach other women because pa like, I think Guatemala is still one of the malnourished countries in the world. And for yeah. her, it's just so easy to- oh, uh, to grow food in Guatemala, you know, so much knowledge, so much knowledge that can't be lost. Um, you know, and it's it's not about documenting with the Latin names. It's about empowering these communities to to transmit to to their you know to their offspring to teach their children. You know that that's the food and um, that's the medicine. And and it's so important to help communities transmit that to their children and their grandchildren. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's like where most of that like old school knowledge is lost because especially my generation in many ways, because the internet possibly and all these things, it's like somehow the elders have become old people. And it's like, yeah. it's up to us to change that back to actually have elders that we can look up to and like the, the elders that can pass down the information and then you don't have to go into to an institution, right? Like I'm, I actually heard the story, I don't know if you're familiar, but like it's been on my mind recently more so, but about this, elderly Japanese mushroom cultivator that lives in the sacred valley in Peru and he it takes apprentices and I feel like one yeah. day I, I can like boost up my mushroom cultivation skills and that's way more interesting to me to learn from yeah. an individual with lots of skills and to help them out and have this symbiotic relationship instead of having an 
basically, I don't know what you call it, but like a parasitic relationship almost with an institution that you pay a lot of money and you just get like an info dump, but not necessarily the practical skills. Uh, and, but then you get a paper. Ooh, you get a fancy paper with a stamp. It's, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not, the, it's not for everybody. You know, I, I never went to a university to study mycology either. And when it got to the point I was offered to do a PhD, and, um, and, you know, this institution said, you know, so you want to do your PhD in mycology? I was like, you know, I, I barely got through my, the first stage. I was so hooked on fungi that I was just studying fungi and self-taught for 16 years, right? So when I got to that point, they, uh, you know, my friend said, so what are you going to do with a PhD? I said, well, I'm going to work in the foundation. I'm like, well, why are you going to leave the foundation for four years to get you know, to do that, and I, I, I'm not doing any of this, you know, I just continued, no. I've just, yeah, um, platform, and, but it's also amazing when people do want to go in and follow and learn from, you know, an academic who has many years of, of knowledge in specific groups, I think, I don't think one's better than the other, I think they're just different paths, you know, hmm. yeah. I cannot agree more. And I, I do think that a lot of people choose one path because it's like a society enforces it. But there's also this, like a lot of people would be like, oh, I have the op option to have a PhD. I can put doctor in front of my name. Ooh, yeah. fancy. You know, it's a little like I feel academics and ego are very intricately um, intertwined. And yeah. um, there's so much, there's so much out there. <laughs> there's so much out there. there and you know, it's, it's just that there, there's, it's hard to just generalize, but but there are some there are also some very cool people in academia. I think it has to be said, you know, there are some very cool oh for sure, hundred percent. Like yeah. I've uh, like I think uh, uh, Dr. Robert Card Harris is one of those super happy yeah. people in academia, and like that's the work that's really important right now. And um, Suzanne Simar is also in academia, right? Yeah. And like I feel like her her new book is will probably empower so many more women to do field work and like live yeah. that that lifestyle and find the mother tree themselves uh, like isn't that incredible yeah, th th she's amazing yeah amazing yeah like her writing is so powerful i was very uh, very impressed like how it's a uh, it's a really beautiful combination of like storytelling and interpersonal storytelling and like root storytelling but then like fused with uh, academia it actually made me think of uh, the hidden life of trees all the time yeah, yeah. And i was very what about merlin's book i love oh. It's amazing. It's like he's such a good storyteller, and he, although, uh, like, what I really liked about this is that there's like, something there for everybody, right? Like, I've learned something, and I've already done, like, read most of like, the mycology books, except for Nicholas Money. Um, yeah. But also, like, for people that, to have an introduction into mycology, I think it's, and that's what we need, right? We need more people that want to have that, like, that fire lit inside of them. And I think his book is excellent for people to want to go deeper and want to learn more. And I think also, you know, he ends with a beautiful story of brewing like this, a cider from the, from uh, yeah, Newton's Darwin's. tree. And I think, yeah. Newton? I don't know Newton's, yeah, it was Newton's tree. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's, that story is just like, ah, full on. <laughs> but like, I'm also, I, I was definitely biased because I've been, a fan of uh, Rupert Sheldrake and uh, Cosmo Sheldrake even before I knew Merlin was in existence. So I knew it like anything this family produces must be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, we're honored that the foundation to also have him be a part. He's, he's a, on our advisory board and we, we do a lot of stuff together. He's just amazing. Yeah. I'm I'm so glad. I'm so glad that he that you know that book it's also so timely after the Fantastic Fungi film that that, that Entangled Life came out. That really was the, the, the combination of what took you know what took us all from like the underground more to the mainstream. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I really lived it because I was just you know in the space and it, it was it's the powerful combination of Fantastic Fungi with Entangled Life, I think, that really did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like fantastic fungi is like full on the the spark and well, man, we 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 make hooked. Yeah, yeah, we make time lapses of mushrooms here as well, and we're like so impressed what Louis does. It's like if uh, Louis ever does a time la like time lapse mushroom masterclass, we're the first people to get there. Yeah, most of those mushroom images are Stephen Axford's. Ah, Stephen Axford's uh, the time lapses too. Yeah, most of the time lapses of mushrooms are Stephen's. Yeah, do you know Stephen? 
Planet Fungi. Yeah, is that this is the Australian Planet Fungi? Uh, like, yeah, that's cool because the the our uh, the director, our creative director is also Australian. So it seems to be something with like Australians and mushroom time lapses. Yeah, <laughs> it's very special. Well, not all of them, I think, but almost all of them are are Stevens. And, yeah, uh, like he must use like a box, right? Because there's no way that you can have a consistent lighting. So you find like a pinhead of an amanita in a forest and you make like a set and a box around it. But he, like, he so yeah, he, he actually has a container in his, you know, he lives right on a forest and he, and he takes um, logs and substrates into like a container and he has a controlled setting there. Um, it's a, you but know, how is he doing the ectomycorrhizae's? Well, there aren't too many if you look closely. <laughs> mm, but there's an amanita. Um, yeah, there's an amanita. Uh, you can actually, with the amanitas, um, you can take a very small pinhead with a chunk of soil and you can fully grow your amanita. You know, it will, yeah, I mean, I, I've been doing that for, for a long time. I, if I want to get good shots, we, we take, even if they're ectomycorrhizal, um, you can take a chunk of, it's not ideal sustainability wise, but you take a chunk of the soil and you can take it back to a place and, and see the growth with the right humidity. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not impossible. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. We know yeah. what to do now. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. And the other one, the one I always do is, you know, just take the shit to the house and water, poo, water, dung. Mm. Take a big, a cow pat, you know, cow shit, put it, you know, mm -hmm. on your table and water it and then things grow. <laughs> it works. No, yeah, for sure. hundred yeah. percent. Not only like, cow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I could do this all day with you, uh, Juliana. And uh, this is already like one of the longest ones we've done here so far, but I don't want to take much more of your time. Thank you so much for all the work you do and coming on. Now, if anytime something up and you want to pop on here, you're always welcome. And don't, don't hesitate to send me a message and we'll blast it out on here and a newsletter and everything. Go follow Juliana's personal. Go follow Fungi Academy. Go donate to Fungi Foundation yeah. at every.org, Fungi Foundation. And go follow Fungi Foundation too. And um, is there anything else you want to share with the people watching now? Like 50 people have stayed with us for all this time. Big, big mush hug and, and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Yes, I'm Thanks. sure it will happen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> stoked for it. So much well, love. Yes, the life will be saved. Ciao. Big, ciao. <laughs> Do the mush